Whereas the Iliad was the story of Achilles and a story of war, the Odyssey is a story of Odysseus and his attempt to come home and to be able to establish peace among his family. The story begins with a very forlorn and despondent Telemachus, sitting in the midst of his father's house, surrounded by suitors who have come to court the hand of his mother. And he sits wishing that his father would return and solve his problems for him. Very shortly though, he is joined by Athena, the goddess in disguise, who takes on the name Mentor. And she guides him to establish himself and his strength in his own home and confront the challenge of driving the suitors from his house and ensuring that he, rather than one of those suitors, will be the next king of Ithaca. Under Athena, or Mentor's encouragement, Telemachus approaches the suitors and demands that they remove themselves from his house. They staunchly refuse, and particularly the character Antinous, whose name means contrary-minded. They rebuff him and accuse him of being out of his place as a young man to challenge them and attempt to keep them from wooing the hand of his mother. However, he is determined, and though he is not capable of standing up to the suitors himself, he is given counsel by Athena to go and find what news he can regarding his father and to travel to see Nestor in the town of Pylos and Menelaus and his wife Helen in Sparta. Telemachus does visit Nestor and though <clears throat> he doesn't find much information from Nestor, he does find to his dismay that the story of Agamemnon has not been a very happy one. Agamemnon, he finds, on his return has actually been slain by his wife who has been completely faithless in his absence. Well, traveling then on to see Menelaus, he has another somewhat despairing picture of what marriage can be as Menelaus and Helen, while he visits with them, in a surfacey way do give him information regarding his father Odysseus, but seem to revel the opportunity to bicker about their own history before Telemachus at court. Seeing these two somewhat disappointing visions of marriage, Telemachus can only hope for the best as his own father returns home to establish his marriage with his wife Penelope. Telemachus, after talking with Menelaus and Helen, decides to return back to Ithaca. And as he does, we find the suitors are actually planning to ambush him and kill him. Well, these first four books of the Odyssey are referred to as the Telemachy. They are the story of Telemachus, and they set the story for us by showing just what a great need there is for Odysseus to return home and retake his own house. His wife is under siege from suitors who come and eat out of his own home, and his son is at the mercy of men who would gladly take his life. At the end of the Telemachy, we are finally introduced to our main character, Odysseus, and his stance is very similar to that of Telemachus. He sits hoping that someone will solve his problems. However, the gods intervene on Odysseus' behalf and our story will begin. Odysseus happens to be kept on the island of a beautiful goddess by the name of Calypso. She has fallen in love with him and she has offered to him the opportunity to come and live with her, be an immortal, and forever enjoy a deathless beauty. Instead of being enticed by that opportunity, Odysseus sits on the seashore, looking toward his home, weeping over the fact that he cannot be with his wife. Odysseus has the gods intervene on his behalf who come to Calypso and would say, after eight years of keeping Odysseus captive, that he is to be released. Calypso very unwillingly does so, and Odysseus builds a raft and sets out upon the sea, hoping somehow to come back to his home. Well, the god Poseidon is quite set against him, and so he sends a storm against Odysseus and his little raft, destroys the raft, and Odysseus, within inches of his very life, ends up on the shore of the Phaeacians. The Phaeacians will receive him very kindly. However, it is only because he is able to charm the princess Nisikaea, 
and bring her to see him as a plausible match. The Phaeacans, King Alcinous and his queen, entertain Odysseus lavishly. Even before they know his name, the king begins to make him offers of marriage to his daughter. Well, at the feast of the Phaeacians, Odysseus finally does reveal his name. And to their astonishment, they now know that it is the famous Odysseus, the one who had the genius of the Trojan horse that they are now entertaining. Well, they ask him to tell his tale. And at this point, we get most of the stories that we are so familiar with in the Odyssey. As Odysseus, sitting at the Feast of the Phaeacians, will now tell his tales. Most all of the tales that he tells in some way show the moral failings of his men. Very rarely do they encounter tragedy that seems to have no connection at all to their own inability to control their passions and to use their wisdom to get themselves through life's trials. The first trial that they have is with the Sicones. They are a people who are warlike, and though they stop and raid their countryside, the men do not take proper caution in returning to the ships quickly and making away with their stolen booty. While the men feast upon the booty that they have stolen on the beaches, the Siconians go and gather together an armed force and come back and slay many of Odysseus's men before they can beat a hasty retreat. Next is the adventure of the Lotus Eaters. Now, on this particular island, Odysseus finds that there is a magical plant that when one eats of it, it makes one have particularly good feelings. And one has such a strong desire for the feelings that this plant gives that you are willing to forget your very family and all those who hold you dear as you spend the rest of your days simply eating this pleasure-giving plant. This Island of the Lotus Eaters is a wonderful contrast to what Odysseus is trying not to let happen to him. Odysseus is trying to return to his home to remember those who depend upon him and show himself faithful to the promises that he has made in the past. The most famous of Odysseus's adventures is the adventure with the Cyclops Cave. And as such, it requires a special location. Well, Odysseus, when he comes to the island of the Cyclops, he and his men find one of their caves and go in looking for shelter. However, when the Cyclops comes back, he takes a very large stone and puts it right over the front of the cave entrance. Odysseus and his men attempt to make friends with the Cyclops. However, the godless Cyclops does not know of the obligations of hospitality that all the good followers of Zeus always show. However, the Cyclops decides that he will show his hospitality towards Odysseus and his men by eating them one by one. Well, Odysseus gives the Cyclops some wine, and the Cyclops, out of great gratitude and kindness, decides that Odysseus will be eaten last. Odysseus is very grateful for this privilege to see his comrades be eaten one by one, and so he and his men decide to take counsel together and figure out how they can defeat the Cyclops. So Odysseus and his men decide that after the Cyclops falls asleep from the wine that he has drunk, they will take a large stick and put out his one eye. Well, having effectively done this, the Cyclops cannot catch them any longer. However, he still has the stone on the front of the cave. And Odysseus and his men need to wait until he has actually removed that stone before being able to escape the cave. Odysseus and his men wait for the Cyclops to remove the stone, and as his sheep go out, they actually, in a very clever fashion, ride on the underside of the sheep and are able to escape from the Cyclops hidden underneath those sheep. Well, <clears throat> as Odysseus and his men escape from the cave, the Cyclops asks Odysseus what his name is. Odysseus says, my name is Utis, meaning no one. When the Cyclops goes to tell his friends what has happened, he says, no one is hurting me. His friends take it that the Cyclops has gone crazy and do not lend him any assistance at all. Well, Odysseus escapes, and <clears throat> in a moment of rare emotion of Odysseus, he boasts to the Cyclops that, in fact, his name is Odysseus. Once the Cyclops has that name, he sends up a prayer to his god Poseidon, 
and asks him to curse Odysseus on his way home. So, as Odysseus travels back over the sea, he constantly has the god of the sea, Poseidon, dogging him and causing him trouble. There's a very interesting thing about that name, Utis. Utis means no one, and Odysseus is exactly trying to run from that fate of becoming a nobody. Like the men who eat of the lotus, he could very easily become no one by forgetting his relationship of father, his relationship of son, his relationship of husband. And in forgetting those relationships, he would become a nobody. So in fact, the name that he gives himself is precisely the great danger he must flee as he attempts to reassert himself as father, son, and husband. Next, Odysseus goes to the island of Aeolia, and there he finds Father Aeolus, and he is the father of the winds. He takes all the winds, puts them into a bag, and gives Odysseus gentle sailing for the rest of the way home. Well, as Odysseus is just about to Ithaca, his men actually open the bag, thinking he must have gold hidden in there. All the winds are released, and Odysseus is blown all the way back to the island of Aeolia. Odysseus approaches Aeolus again, asking help once more, but he is rejected. Aeolus is convinced that Odysseus and his men are cursed, and he will have nothing to do with them. After their adventure with the Lastragonians, next Odysseus comes to the island of Aiaia, where there is the witch Circe. Now, Circe has the ability to turn men into beasts. And when Odysseus' men go and see Circe, they take her to be a beautiful woman who they can trust. Well, in their foolishness, they come right into her trap, and they themselves are turned into animals. This is particularly appropriate for Odysseus' men, as they don't seem to have the rational capacities of a human being, and do seem to be like animals. However, Odysseus, when he sees that something has gone wrong, receives help from the gods, and using the special bow that he has given for protection, he goes to Circe and demands that his men be disenchanted. Circe receives Odysseus as a friend, and feasts both him and his men, and then gives him advice to how he can most easily come home. The witch Circe counsels Odysseus and tells him in order to get home, he must receive counsel from the dead prophet Tiresias in Hades itself. So Odysseus journeys to the underworld, and after receiving counsel from Tiresias, he speaks with Agamemnon, who he also gives Odysseus this sad tale of his own homecoming. Betrayed by his wife, Agamemnon is now despondent of the possibility of ever having another virtuous woman. Also, Odysseus meets Ajax, and Ajax was greatly offended by Odysseus during the end of the Trojan War, and Ajax will not even speak with Odysseus. He simply gives him a cold shoulder and a very stern stare. After descending into Hades, Odysseus returns, and he must first pass by the island of the Sirens. The island of the Sirens is also a particularly a telling moment for Odysseus as it shows the difference between he and his men. Odysseus actually has to keep his men from being lured away by the enchanting songs of these beautiful sirens. They are half woman and half bird, but they lure sailors to their deaths by singing them beautiful songs that make them feel that they must be greatly in love with them. Well, the rocks all around the island of the sirens are covered with the white bones of sailors who have been destroyed by them. However, Odysseus, desiring to hear the song of the sirens and yet not give in to their temptation, has himself tightly bound to the mast of his ship. Whereas all of his men have wax put in their ears in order to keep them from hearing the temptations, Odysseus binds himself to the mast. Well, this is a nice image for how Odysseus is able to get through his many trials. He takes his will and binds it to something solid, something that does not bend. His men always bend before their temptations, and Odysseus takes four caution to make sure that he does not bend before those temptations. And because of that, he's the only one among his men who returns home alive. After the island of the Sirens has been successfully passed, Odysseus must go through the twin tares of Charybdis and Scylla. And again, even though Odysseus' men would not be able to keep their wits about them as they traveled through both of these terrifying monsters, Odysseus takes his ship 
and goes right through the two of them, using his calm and using his caution to successfully go through this trial. After telling these exciting tales to the Fayakins, they finally put him onto a ship and after a fond farewell to the Princess Nasikia, they send him back to his island. Curiously, when he arrives, he does not recognize the island for the home he loves. Athena has to come to him and tell him that he has in fact returned to his beloved home. However, the Phaeacans will not return home. The god Poseidon is so angry at them for returning Odysseus back to his home island that he strikes their ship to stone and the Phaeacans go to a watery death in their own harbor. In books 14 through 24, we see a new stage that our story has reached in the Odyssey. Previously, Odysseus had been struggling to return home, and now in books 14 through 24, we see him taking up the challenge of reasserting his own authority in that home. Odysseus first meets up with the pious swineherd Eumaeus. Readers with a sensitive conscience have most likely noticed that there is much about Odysseus that is far from admirable. Not only is he a compulsive liar, but contrary to his desire to return to his wife, he has slept with Circe and Calypso. Well, before you entirely disregard Odysseus as a character from whom you can learn, I would suggest that Homer does not mean for Odysseus to be a character that we look upon as being faultless. Now, it should be noted that Homer can write a character who is nearly morally faultless. If you would prefer a character who has absolutely no apparent faults, your character is Eumaeus the swineherd. Eumaeus the swineherd is so full of duty towards his long lost master, piety towards the gods, and a desire to do everything that would be right and just in the gods' eyes. There's no possibility that you can have any doubt, but this, this man is of absolutely faultless moral character. Odysseus comes to Eumaeus' hut, and though Athena has disguised Odysseus as a beggar, Eumaeus has him in and gives him the most generous treatment he can. Well, Odysseus tests his swineherd to see if he is in fact still faithful, and he finds yes, he is still abundantly faithful to his master. Odysseus also finds that Eumaeus has not only stayed loyal to him, but he has continued to do his labors without fault. While he is in Eumaeus' hut, um, Telemachus, his son, comes and Odysseus, even in disguise at this point, is able to become reconnected with his son. Before revealing himself, he tests his son's character and as soon as he reveals himself as his long-lost father, he begins to instruct him and guide him in the ways of controlling his emotions and making sure that he can pass the trials that he has been faced with. Now, Telemachus and Odysseus make plans to overthrow the suitors. They know that they must be careful as the suitors are well armed and there's many of them. And the first thing that they decide to do is test the suitors. And so Odysseus retakes his disguise and goes down into his own home and acts like a beggar. The curious thing about this is that Odysseus is actually coming to his own home and begging his own food from men who have taken it without any right warrant. Well, Odysseus, in this moment of irony, finds that the suitors are indeed a very corrupt lot. There is very little to find in them that is in all worthy of commendation. And Odysseus even finds that the goat herd, Melanthios, has become corrupt as well. And his sister, Melantho, has even gone so far as to sleep with the very suitors that her mistress, Penelope, is being courted by. The corruption in this house has gone very far. 20 years absence has allowed this house to become full of moral corruption that indeed shows the reader that when Odysseus slaughters these suitors, that he is not just a mass killer, but in fact someone acting with the hand of justice and most likely the hand of the gods. Odysseus goes throughout the house and tests the character of the various suitors, finding them all wanting. He even is challenged by the local panhandler, a fellow by the name of Iros, that he does not have a right to beg at this location and that it's actually his territory. And so to the great delight of the suitors, 
Odysseus and Iros have a contest and they have a boxing match to find out who will be the panhandler who will have the rights to beg in this house. Well, Odysseus cleans the clock of poor old Iros and very soon the suitors begin to realize that something greater than a mere man has come into their midst and foreboding moments of the judgment to come upon them start to be heard. At this point, we have what must be seen as the relational climax to our story. Odysseus comes to Penelope in the guise of the beggar and tests to see whether or not she is still faithful to him. Well, Penelope also has news that Odysseus is back on the island, and so she too must have her suspicions as to who this beggar must be. She also has the ability to test him to see if he has still continued faithful to their love. There's a very delightful interchange that goes on between the two of them as being gone 20 years, there must obviously be a real sense of detachment and earnest concern that they have to come with to restarting this relationship. Penelope tells Odysseus that tomorrow morning there will be a trial of the bow and <clears throat> Odysseus agrees to come. Penelope has told Odysseus that he has an opportunity to once again win her hand. He is glad to do this. He wins the contest of the bow the next morning and after successfully winning the contest of the bow, he takes that same bow and turns it upon the suitors. The first, of course, is the very contrary Antinous. He kills Antinous and then after Telemachus and Eumaeus hide all of the suitors' weapons and lock the doors, they begin shooting every one of the suitors. Every one of them is killed, and even after that, the corrupt maids are killed as well. And finally, Odysseus cleanses his hall of the blood of the suitors, gradually finding that his hall is cleansed, he can be reunited with his wife Penelope. Penelope still has her concerns, wondering if in fact the gods are playing some trick upon her, giving her an image of her husband that is in fact not true. She tests him by making mention of their bed. And she says to one of the servants that they ought to take the bed and move it out of their room. Odysseus objects. He knows that that bed has actually been made from a tree trunk that cannot be moved. And so he says that cannot be done. At this moment, Penelope knows for certain that this is, in fact, her husband returned after such a long time, and she embraces him, weeps tears of love, and they have their long-awaited reunion. The story's not over, though. Odysseus has killed many of the princes of the island of Ithaca, as well as the area about, and now he must be held account by the families of those suitors. They come to attack him, but yet Odysseus with his son Telemachus on one side and his father Laertes and the swineherd Eumaeus on the other are able to resist these families in battle and his home stands secure. Odysseus has been able to reassert himself as father, son, husband, and king of Ithaca. In the same way that the Iliad has its central theme war, the Odyssey is about family, and at the center of every family is a marriage. And throughout the Odyssey, you have three marriages that very much define the possibilities that a marriage can face. In the first case, you have Agamemnon and Clytemnestra. Clytemnestra is unfaithful to her husband with good provocation, as he actually gave their daughter as a human sacrifice to appease the winds that were keeping the armies from being able to sail for Troy. When Agamemnon comes home, his wife is taken up with another man by the name of Aegisthus, and she welcomes him home by slaying him in his own bathtub. The section I would like to read to you is from Book 11 of the Odyssey, and in this section you hear Agamemnon lamenting his betrayal by his own wife. There is no being more fell, more bestial, than a wife in such an action. And what an action that one planned. The murder of her husband and her lord. Great God, I thought my children, my slaves at least, would give me welcome. But that woman, plotting a thing so low, defiled herself and all her sex, all women yet to come, 
even those few who may be virtuous. Agamemnon tells Odysseus that he considers Odysseus's Penelope not to be of such a character as his own wife Clytemnestra. He says she is too wise for that. However, in the marriage of Clytemnestra and Agamemnon, we see how disastrously a family can end. Here, in a sort of familial civil war, we have wife slaying husband. However, the other picture that we have of marriage in the Odyssey is also not so particularly encouraging. The marriage of Helen and Menelaus is most unadmirable. We find that the face who launched a thousand ships is indeed living with her husband and they are celebrating the double marriage of their children. However, you don't have to watch very closely to see that this marriage is simply a powder keg of animosity ready to go off. Helen and Menelaus, when Telemachus meets them, actually indulge themselves in public bickering, fighting over old memories and contentions of who is in the honor regarding the Trojan War. Helen is very eager to try to show that she, throughout the entire Trojan War, was actually on the side of the Greeks, and Menelaus quickly contradicts her, showing her to, in fact, have been a traitor right up to the very end. In Book 4 and Line 250, Helen is talking to Telemachus, and she is going to tell Telemachus a story about his father, Odysseus. However, very quickly you notice this story is not about Odysseus. This story is about her, and it's about how she was so faithful to the Greeks all the way up to the very end of the Trojan War. She tells the story of Odysseus coming and finding her in Troy and entrusting her with great secrets, and she takes him in, gives him aid, and actually even helps him slay Trojans. And she boasts that she had turned around and had been on the side of the Greeks in the earliest portions of the war. O oh, Menelaus, Atreus' royal son, and you that are great heroes' sons, you know how Zeus gives all of us in turn good luck and bad luck, being all powerful. So take refreshment, take your ease in hall, and cheer the time with stories. I'll begin. Not that I think of naming, far less telling, every feat of that rugged man, Odysseus, but here is something that he dared to do at Troy, where you Achaeans endured the war. He had first given himself an outrageous beating and thrown some rags on like a household slave, then slipped into the city of wide lanes among his enemies. So changed he looked as never before upon the Achaean beachhead, but like a beggar merged in the townspeople, and no one there remarked him, but I knew him. Even as he was, I knew him and questioned him how shrewdly he put me off. But in the end, I bathed him and anointed him, put a fresh cloak around him and swore an oath not to give him away as Odysseus to the Trojans till he got back to camp where the long ships lay. He spoke up then and told me about the Achaeans and their plans and then swarded many Trojans through the body on his way out with what he learned of theirs. The Trojan women raised a cry but my heart sang, for I'd come round long before to dreams of sailing home, and I repented the mad day Aphrodite drew me away from my fatherland, forsaking all, child, bridal bed, and husband, a man without defect in form or mind. After Helen tells a very complimentary story of herself and attempts to portray her own virtuous history, her husband Menelaus is so kind as to simply undercut her story with a direct contradiction replied the red-haired Captain Menelaus, An excellent tale, my dear, and most becoming. In my life I have met in many countries foresight and wit in many first-rate men, but never have I seen one like Odysseus for steadiness and a stout heart. Here, for instance, is what he did, had the cold nerve to do inside the hollow horse, where we were waiting, picked men all of us for the Trojan slaughter, when all of a sudden you came by. I dare say, drawn by some superhuman power that planned an exploit for the Trojans. And Deiphobus, that handsome man, came with you. Three times you walked around it, patting it everywhere, and called by name the flower of our fighters, making your voice sound like their wives, calling. Diomedes and I crouched in the center, along with Odysseus. We could hear you plainly. And listening, we too were swept by waves of longing to reply or go. Odysseus fought us down despite our craving, and all the Achaeans kept their lips shut tight, all but Antichlus. Desire moved his throat to hail you, but Odysseus' great hands clamped over his jaws and held. 
So he saved us all till Pallas Athena led you away at last. Menelaus tells a story in direct contradiction of his wife's claims. She would have us to believe that she was a faithful Greek from the beginning of the war, and now Menelaus shows that even to the very end, the day of the Trojan horse and its exploits, she was on the side of the Trojans. It's not very encouraging to see that a marriage where man and wife stay together and go through the activities of family can still end up being so shallow and such a place of contention. Telemachus must not receive great encouragement from this vision. However, when we see his father Odysseus and his mother Penelope reunite, we see another vision for marriage showing how family can in fact be so enduring and so strong. In contrast to the marriages of Agamemnon and Menelaus, which appear to be fairly discouraging regarding the prospects and hopes for a strong family, in Penelope and Odysseus, we see two people coming together, desiring to maintain their loyalty to one another, maintaining their connection with one another, and doing that in a fashion that shows they're actually very aware of the problems that can come upon these fragile unions. The section I'm going to read to you is from Book 19, and Penelope and Odysseus are speaking. However, Odysseus is in the disguise of a beggar. And though Penelope does not know for certain that it is him, she does know that he is in fact on the island and probably has good suspicions about who she's talking to. And in the course of this discussion, Odysseus has, in the guise of the beggar, said that Odysseus plans to come home in two weeks. He has a very good plan that he's going to go out and get great riches enough for 10 generations of their family to live on, and then he'll return. Well, curiously, Penelope has another plan. And so you have, you might say, once again, a bit of marital bickering going on. However, in this case, Odysseus is willing to listen to Penelope's demand. And after being gone for 20 years, it's very reasonable that she is not interested at all in having him leave for another two weeks. And he's willing to come up to her demand that he meet tomorrow morning and once again show his worthiness of her. Where we're going to pick up the story is shortly after Penelope recounts to Odysseus a dream that she has had. In her dream, she tells him that there's an eagle that has swooped down upon their home and has killed the numerous geese that are in her hall. Well, the geese are the suitors. And Penelope actually says that she's a little sad to see that the geese have been killed. And she asks Odysseus, what do you think the interpretation of this dream is? Well, this supposed beggar replies that in fact this dream is about indeed her husband returning to kill the suitors. The master of subtle ways and straight replied, My dear, how can you choose to read the dream differently? Has not Odysseus himself shown you what is to come? Death to the suitors and sure death too. No one escapes his doom. Penelope shook her head and answered, Friend, many and many a dream is mere confusion, a cobweb of no consequence at all. Two gates for ghostly dreams there are, one gateway of honest horn and one of ivory. Issuing by the ivory gate are dreams of glimmering illusions, fantasies. But those that are come through solid polished horn may be borne out, if mortals only know them. Curiously here, Penelope instructs her would-be husband that dreams do not happen simply for the wishing. Mortals must know them, and mortals must make them come true. Penelope gives Odysseus an opportunity to make that dream come true. She offers to him the next morning, not two weeks from now, the opportunity to come and do battle for her hand. Once again, winning her and showing his worthiness of her as a wife. I doubt it came by horn, my fearful dream, too good to be true, that for my son and me. But one thing more I wish to tell you, listen carefully. It is a black day, this that comes. Odysseus' house and I are to be parted. I shall decree a contest for the day. We have twelve axe heads. In his time my lord could line them up, all twelve at intervals, like a ship's ribbing. Then he'd back away, a long way off, and whip an arrow through. 
Now all impose this trial on the suitors, the one who easily handles and strings the bow and shoots through all twelve axes I shall marry. Whoever he may be, then look my last on this my first love's beautiful brimming house, but I'll remember, though I dream it only. When Odysseus speaks to her in this interview, he calls her again and again, wife of Odysseus, as if to remind her who she is. He does not want her to forget her identity as his wife, and he is so eager to take his place as husband again that he will be willing to take up the contest of the bow the next morning, even though if he loses and does not play his cards right, he will be a dead man. He is willing to risk his life to win this woman who he has waited for for so long. Odysseus said, Dear honorable lady, wife of Odysseus Laertiades, let there be no postponement of the trial. Odysseus, who knows the shifts of combat, will be here. A, he will be here long before one of these lads can stretch or string that bow or shoot to thread the iron. Grave and wise, Penelope replied. What's so lovely about Penelope's reply is you see that she is very eager for her husband to return to her. He could very well be frightened by the challenge that stands before him and perhaps go off for another 20 years. But she does not want that to happen. And so even though she makes him face the challenge of the bow, she wants to lure him to their bed and to remind him of the pleasures therein. At this point, there's a lovely bit of wifely enticement where she invites him to sleep below while she goes up to her lonely single bed. If you were willing to sit with me and comfort me, my friend, no tide of sleep would ever close my eyes, but mortals cannot go forever sleepless. This undying God's decree for all who live and die on earth, kind furrowed earth. Upstairs I go then to my single bed, my sighing bed, wet with so many tears after my Lord Odysseus took ship to see that misery at Ilion unspeakable. Let me rest there, you here. You can stretch out on the bare floor, or else command a bed. The last line is very telling. She says, you can stretch out on the bare floor or else command a bed. That's exactly the two options that are awaiting him tomorrow morning. He will be dead, or he will once again be the master of her bed, her husband returned from so many years absent. These two show the delightful struggle that those who value family and devalue humanity as it is meant to be lived are willing to enter into. They are willing to wait, they are willing to suffer, they are willing to take dangers to remember who they are, to lay hold of their commitments, their family relationships, and to endure so that they will not forget who they are and end up being a nobody. As Odysseus sits on the shores of the island of Calypso and contemplates his choice, whether or not to return to his aged wife and die together with her, possibly on the same day, or to stay on the island of Calypso and live with the beautiful immortal goddess that has fallen in love with him, he seems to have no question. He sits on the shore and weeps to return to his wife. For that action, I call Odysseus the hero of humanity. He chooses humanness. He chooses to die with the one he chose to love in his youth. In Book 10 of Plato's Republic, one of the last stories Plato tells is of Odysseus in the afterlife choosing his next life. And Odysseus, being known for great wisdom, chooses the life of a common man without great worldly trouble with the opportunity to simply do good and to live nobly. Odysseus, in his wisdom, in his cleverness, is understood to have grasped one thing, the goodness of being human and loving the human life that we have been given to live. Curiously, that means that he doggedly attempts to reassert his family, to return to his wife, his son, his father, and his home, and to continue the life that he chose as a young man. Now, we all know that family has its conflicts. Family is often 
a cauldron and pressure cooker of all sorts of internal dissensions and conflicts. And yet, it dominates the storyline of this epic that our society has admired for so many years. What is it about family that draws us so much? Why is it so important to us and keeps on calling us back, even when we know that it's full of controversy and even times danger to ourselves? This is even made more curious by the fact that there are many creatures who can survive with the most flimsy of family relationships. Cats and dogs make a wonderful example. Why is it that we as human beings are so drawn to this institution and find it so important to a life lived well? Odysseus had many opportunities to choose a different life, but he continues to risk danger, his own life itself, to return to the family he knows and that he's chosen. I think the best conclusion that we can come to from this is simply the fact that we were made to know and be known, to love and to be loved. And in order to do that, we need the context of those who we are most connected to, those who we live our lives with, those who we bring children into the world with. Those connections are precisely the connections that give us the opportunity to be deeply known and deeply loved. This is the life that Odysseus and Penelope struggle for. This is the life that they sacrifice for. This is the life that they are willing to live for. Curiously, in the life of faith, the very prayer that defines the church uses familial terms. Our Father who art in heaven. Time and again, the Christian life is described and delineated in terms that make reference to the family metaphor. We are children of God, sons of faith. Again and again, our life in God is described as a family life. It is best to think of our life here in families as a sort of education in the life that we are to live in God. God has set up the family in order to teach us something about what it means to live in communion with Him, what it does mean to be deeply known and deeply loved, to have a life that we share together of trust and knowing. Curiously though, even though family is a glorious institution in which we learn so much about what it means to live in fellowship with God and His family, our families are ultimately supplanted. Jesus says that in heaven there is no marriage and no begetting of children. And in Matthew 10, 37, he says, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So though God uses family as an institution in which we learn so much, ultimately the family that he desires us to be part of is much higher and we are to supplant the relationships that we have on this earth with ones that will last forever. God uses family to teach us what it means to belong and to be known and then calls us to a higher family. Being a child and being a parent are ultimately significant because we are called to be brothers of Christ and children of God. Galatians 3.26 says, In Christ you are all children of God through faith. All of you who are baptized into Christ have closed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. You belong to Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Marriage, family, seem to be an institution that God has made particularly crucial to us precisely because he wants to teach us of the life that he wants us to live in him. Odysseus and Penelope give us a delightful vision into what that life can be, how it is to be lived, and how we ought to struggle to maintain it.